Jerome Kern, The Man and His Music. Your narrator is Kenneth Banghart. Jerome David Kern, born 1885, died 1945, just ten years ago this month. During his span of 60 years, the world did everything but turn inside out. It staggered from horse-drawn carriage to jet-propelled plane, through two global wars, a major depression, and a host of lesser mishaps. In all this chaos, the melodies of Jerome Kern have not only survived... They've become a sort of ideal standard for later composers of popular music to aim at. And nowadays, when someone says they don't write music like that anymore, he may unconsciously be paying his respects to Jerome Kern, an owlish little man in horn-rimmed glasses who, as Andre Castellanos put it, looked less a musician than any man I've ever known. Perhaps the mere statistics indicate the power of his impact. Kern was the composer of melodies for more than half a hundred musical comedies. And at the time of his death, at least 15 of his songs had passed the two million mark in record sales. But statistics are only the outer garment of a man's genius. For the full story, you must look at the man himself and at the boy behind the man. Well, it just happened that I was brought up in Elmhurst, Long Island with Jerome Kern. That's Joseph Myron, the son of an actor who was very popular just at the turn of the century... In 1897, he was one of Jerome Kern's neighborhood pals. Jerry was a wistful, sensitive kid whose only interest seemed to be music. He was very, very nervous type and very retiring. And uh, in the schoolyard, he was always in a lot of trouble because there were a lot of antagonistic boys there and everything could make fun of a little fellow like that. The kids at school used to gang up on him, the bullies around the schoolyard, and some of us protected him because we respected his piano playing. My father gave me a good allowance, and I used to turn it into candy and bribe the bullies with nuggets of sweetness to keep him from getting a bloody nose. That candy, in the light of after events, was well invested in it. After high school, Jerry Kern studied at the New York College of Music, where he was a good but not a brilliant student. And then after a rather unsuccessful fling at the family's furniture business, his father saw the wisdom of additional music study, this time in Europe. Kern sailed in 1903. It was in London he met the American producer Charles Froman. Guy Bolton, later to become a Kern collaborator and film biographer, remembers what happened next. Jerry had... uh... Tried during his quite early beginnings in New York to uh, get to see Froman, and uh, he never was able to obtain an introduction to him. And Froman at that time was completely sold on doing uh, English shows, both musicals and straight plays. And uh, after Jerry had gone to England, he um, had written a number. Uh, there, Charles Froman heard the number, and... Uh, asked to meet Jerry and made a proposal to him that he should come to uh, America with him and write extra numbers. He said that uh, you Englishmen have a way of writing uh, this type of number so much better than any of our boys do, and I'd like to have you over there. So Jerry didn't uh, disillusion him on the matter of his being an Englishman and sailed with him. And when they reached New York, Froman rather proudly pointing out sights as they came up the harbor, saying that's the Statue of Liberty, and that building with the gold dome on it is the world building, when a woman came up to Jerry and said, I've been in my cabin all the way over, and I didn't know you were here, and how are your family out in Newark? Froman, they say, got a big kick out of Jerry's deception and his embarrassment at being found out, for they later became good friends. Temporarily, though, Kern had to take a job on Tin Pan Alley, not as a composer, but as a pianist. And it was there he met his first American collaborator. I guess I had the relative part in his career that 
The tin Lizzie had in the career of the Ford automobile. Edward Lasker, 21 years old at the time we're talking about, and already a lad with a growing reputation. I dropped in to see a producer who had a show just opened out of town at which I'd written practically the song here, an Indian song called Sweet Little Caribou. And I asked him if he needed anything for the show. He said, yes, I want a duet for Joe Myron. I can see the idea of writing a sort of a burlesque song around the way it's spoon. And I got to the palms. There was Jerry playing away. Jerry, I said, we got a song to do. I've been in to see Paley, and he wants us to do a duet. And I got the idea that how would you like to spoon with me would be an idea. And then to write humorous, burlesque lyrics to it. Great, he said. Well, what have you got? So he took the title and he pushed it around for about five minutes and had a corking melody. Okay, I said, shoot me a vase, and back came a vase, and just as long as it takes to play it now. So I went home, wrote the lyric that evening. Next day, down to came. We rehearsed over to Paley. Some women came in after us, and the office boy we let them in before us. And Crane was very uppish. He said, come on, we'll go over to Alf Heyman. So I told the girl we'd be back later. We went over to Alf Heyman. He was Froman's general manager. He liked the song, only he said the white spoon wouldn't be understood in London. And I said, well, that's really the crux of the song, but I'll see what I can do overnight. We got out on the street, and Jerry said, no, we wouldn't change away. I said, let's go over to Schubert's. We went over to Schubert's, and they were rehearsing Eddie Foy to be starred in The Island and the Girl. Sam Schubert came out, and... Uh, Jerry said, uh, Mr. Schubert, we're protégés of Reginald de Coven. I was more surprised than uh, Schubert because I didn't know who we were until then. So Schubert took us right into a piano. Jerry played, I sang, and Sam Schubert was wild about it. He said, we'll feature it in the Island of Gale immediately. How'd You Like to Spoon With Me became Kern's first big song hit. After it was written, Lasker went on to become a successful songwriter and dramatist and Kern continued his search for a publisher. Robert Russell Bennett, who later became Kern's arranger and close friend, takes up the story. There is a Mr. Max Dreyfus, who is quite a powerful man in the world of light music, and to be in with the Dreyfus brothers was a great feather in any composer's cap. And finally, Kern made it. Some friends got him in to see Mr. Dreyfus. When he went into the office, now bear in mind that this is a long, long time ago, he went into the office of the Dreyfus brothers and he saw on the piano a silk hat and a stick, walking stick. And the gentlemen in the office were all dressed in frock coats. Well, that impressed Jerome B. Kern very, very much. And he went back to his wife and he said, My, this is a high class organization. I'm certainly glad that I'm in a place like that. It's really the big leagues. But he found out about three weeks later that the whole outfit had been out to play a wedding that afternoon and they were dressed accordingly. The Dreyfus brothers, it might be added, soon found it unnecessary to balance the budget by playing at weddings, thanks in part to their new property, Jerome Kern. At this date, though, Broadway producers were not ready to trust Kern with a score for an entire show but he did find a way to get a foot in the door. Guy Bolton remembers it well. It was the custom then. They were putting on all these Austrian uh, musical comedies, and they always wanted uh, a couple of uh, American hit numbers in them. And the other songwriters used to try and find out ahead of time, listen at the doors and, and uh, employ a grapevine to discover when one of these things was going to be done. But Jerry wouldn't do that. He'd wait till they'd been rehearsing for a couple of weeks. And then he would turn up at the rehearsal with the portfolio under his arm and say, uh, do you want any numbers? And they would say, uh, no, we've got all the interpolated numbers we need. And he said, oh, it's too bad. I had something that I thought would interest you. By this time, they were quite tired. And they would say, sit down at the piano and play them. In those days, he played very well. So he'd perform these numbers, and they would throw some other number out and put one of Kern's in. Very crafty dodge. A 
Among those interpolated songs was one Kern wrote for the girl from Utah. The title, They Didn't Believe Me. By now, the name Jerome Kern was becoming familiar in New York professional circles. It became more so when he began to write, with Guy Bolton and P.G. Woodhouse, a series of unique musical shows for the Princess Theater. The shows were successful, and so were the Kern melodies. A theatrical triumvirate had been born. Here's a notation on that subject from the scrapbook of P.G. Woodhouse. This is what uh, George Kaufman wrote in FBA's column. This is the trio of musical fame, Bolton and Woodhouse and Kern. Better than anyone else you can name, Bolton and Woodhouse and Kern. Nobody knows what on earth they've been bitten by. All I can say is I mean to get litten by orchestra seats for the next one that's written by Bolton and Woodhouse and Kern. In these years, Kern's name appeared frequently in the copy of Broadway columnists. It also showed up quite often on the passenger list of ships headed for Europe. On one of these occasions, he was set to go with Charles Froman, the producer who had imported Kern from England just ten years earlier, Guy Bolton. Froman asked him to go back to England with him, and uh, Jerry arranged to do so. He went to a party the night before he was going to sail, when uh, a lot of friends were wishing him well, and drinks were flowing quite freely, and he had... Uh, left an order to be called very early in the morning, and um, he had asked them to wake him at six. And he woke up about that time, but wasn't called. However, that didn't disturb him very much. He started to get dressed. And while he was dressing, it kept getting darker and darker, and he became convinced that it was going to be a dreadful day and a uh, horrible day in which to sail away from New York. He went downstairs with a couple of bags, got in a taxi, and he said to the taxi driver, what's happening to the weather? The taxi driver said, what's wrong with it? And he said, well, it's getting so dark. He said, it should get dark. It's nearly 7 o'clock. Jerry had slept right through the day, and by doing so, he missed sailing with Froman on Froman's last voyage on the Lusitania. On May 17, 1915, just a few miles off the Irish coast, the Lusitania was torpedoed by a German submarine, and Charles Froman was among those who died. Eventually, though, the war ended, and there was no Broadway season that didn't have at least two Kern shows. By 1925, Kern was working with one of the most famous musical comedy writers of them all, the man who later wrote the words for this Kern melody. Kern song, Smoke Gets in Your Eyes, written for the Broadway production of Roberta. But the first show these men worked on together was Sonny. That was in 1925. As I knew him in the beginning, Jerry didn't have much to say except when he did say it. He said it in a very loud and uh, imperious way so that everybody knew what he meant and that he meant everything that he said. He came to me at that time as a very volatile, imperious sort of chap. But I learned afterwards that that, that was more or less of, uh, I wouldn't say an act that he put on, but I feel that that was his way of overcoming what I later learned was the timidity about speaking in the presence of uh, more than his intimates. I remember once hearing Oscar Hammerstein say, Jerry was a man who might anger you, but he certainly would never bore you. And that was very true, as I have had occasion to witness many times. Particularly 
Better say somebody had uh, got a chance to audition for him. A boy or a girl who had spoken his piece or sung his song might have gone away with the idea that Jerry was a very austere and a very severe man because he pulled no punches in expressing his opinion, either as to the ability or the inability of the young people who had uh, auditioned for him. I'm sure that some of the young people that I have seen stand in awe of him while meeting him for the first time would have been certainly surprised to see him at other moments. I remember once we were having a dinner party at the home of Max Dreyfus, his publisher. There must have been 25 or 30 people seated around that big dinner table. And I noticed that Jerry seemed to be busy with something that had to do with his napkin, I thought. When suddenly he got up from the table, marched around the room and made his exit with no trousers on. Of course, it was greeted with shrieks of laughter from everybody present, but it only indicated there was in Jerry an irrepressible kid that would have his way at times. All his friends say of Jerry Kern that he was a man of boundless energy, and even a back-breaking load of work didn't exhaust the supply. His hobbies, therefore, were numerous, and the predominant one was the collection of rare books. Jerome Kern was well known and greatly loved by most of the booksellers of America and England as well. And it has always been said by the various dealers that when he found an item he liked, he never haggled on the price. The voice of Tony Bain. He's an expert on rare books, and the auctioneer Kern turned to when he became worried about his own collection. He had this valuable library in his modest home in Bronxville, New York. There was a source of continual worry to him. Libraries like this, of course, can be insured. But these books cannot be replaced at any price. He finally got to the point where he was too busy to enjoy his books... So he decided to have to let other collectors have the pleasure of acquiring them. Well, it was known to us that the collection had cost him somewhere in the neighborhood of six hundred thousand dollars, let's say six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And just before the sale, someone asked him, "Well, Jerry, what would you take for the collection as it stands right now before the auction takes place?" He said, "I'd be satisfied with seven hundred thousand dollars." sale went on, and after a day or two, oh, I don't know at what, some point in the sale, a note was sent to me from the office giving me the total, which had just passed one million dollars. And I received a telegram from Mr. Kern. The telegram read, Tony, what the hell is going on? So the second part of the sale, which followed the following week, went on, and finally the uh, final total reached was $1,729,462.50, which is the highest ever known at any book sale in any part of the world. Jerome Kern hit the jackpot with the sale of his books, and he hit a literary jackpot the day he was introduced to Oscar Hammerstein II. Their meeting, which was to prove a turning point in the history of the musical stage, occurred in a rather unusual place. Well, oddly enough, we met in a cemetery. It was at the funeral of a famous uh, composer. And I'm not quite sure whether it was Victor Herbert or somebody else. I'm under the impression that it was Victor Herbert's funeral. The Kern-Hammerstein friendship flourished. They collaborated with Otto Harbach on the production of Sonny, a highly successful project. But the most important chapter in their partnership began with the ringing of a phone. Jerry called me up one day when I was down in my Long Island home and said he had read half of a book. And he thought it would be great for us. And I said, what book is that? And he said, Edna Ferber's Showboat. He said, it's got a million-dollar title to begin with, and I think it's wonderful. I've only read half, and I'd like to do it. So I bought a copy of the book and agreed with him, only I read the whole thing. Jerry and I independently made layouts of the story, a, a scenario of what we'd like to keep out of the book, and then we compared notes, and we had done an identical job. He had, he had put in the same scenes that I wanted to keep out of the novel. 
And so the book was chosen. Florence Ziegfeld was picked to produce it. All that remained was getting permission from the author to use her novel. Edna Ferber tells her own part in the story. It was the late Alexander Wolcott who acted as matchmaker in the marriage between the novel entitled Showboat and the music of Jerome Kern. The happy union brought forth a musical play presented by Florence Ziegfeld at the Ziegfeld Theater in 1927. Alec Wolcott, at that time dramatic critic on the New York Times, invited me to go with him to the opening of a new musical play. It was Fred Stone in Stepping Stones at the Globe Theater. In the intermission, we drifted out to the lobby. A pixie-looking little man whom I didn't know, with the most winning smile in the world, fought his way through the lobby crowd toward us. Look, Alec, he said. Uh, I hear, you know, Edna Ferber. Can you kind of arrange for me to meet her sometime soon? I want to talk to her about letting me make a musical play from her showboat. Alec, with that dreadful relish for the dramatic, said musingly, mm, well, it might just possibly be arranged. If you'll have patience and let me do things in my own way, and oh, I will, Alec, uh, I will. Thanks awfully. I'll be waiting. Now, Alec pounced on his dramatic moment. Ferber, this is Jerome Kern. Jerry, Edna Ferber. It was done. So far, everything was going like clockwork. But Ziegfeld, with Rio Rita already playing to a packed house every night, delayed the showboat production for a year, and even then wasn't quite satisfied with the way it was shaping up. Charles Winninger, Captain Andy in the original production, remembers the polishing process. We were rehearsing in the Pennsylvania ballroom, and... Uh... Kern was very, very happy about the show at the time, and he happened to remark to Mr. Ziegfeld, he says, well, he says, boss, he says, I think we've got a hit. And Ziegfeld, in his sort of a nasal twang, says, well, he says, maybe we haven't, maybe we haven't. He says, uh, uh, I would be happier if we had a hit song in the show, something that people could whistle on the way out of the theater, something like, what you, what you wrote for Marilyn Miller, like, who are you waiting for? Who? You know, one of those things. And then Kern, who was a little bit upset about this thing, he sat down at the piano, and in a sort of a tin panny way, he played, uh, why do, da 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 And Ziggy said, I think you've got something there. And Jerry Kern says, do you mean it? And he says, yes. He says, that's whistleable. He says, I think the people will go out of the theater and whistle that. So Kern was kind of convinced about it, and then he turned around and he wrote that beautiful verse in the melody. Well, it stopped the show, and it sold more copies than all the rest of the songs in the show. Well, to make a long story short, it, it really was the whistling hit of the show because people did go out of the theater whistling. There's another number that will probably last even longer, and it provided Edna Ferber with a moment she'll never forget. As the writing of the musical play by Oscar Hammerstein and Jerome Kern progressed, and its ups and downs were even more heartbreaking than those of most musical plays, I heard bits and pieces of the score. I heard Can't Help Loving That Man with its love-bemused lyric. I melted under the bewitching strains of Only Make Believe, and of Why Do I Love You, and Gaylord Ravenel's insolent, careless, gambler song. And then Jerome Kern appeared at my apartment late one afternoon 
with a strange look of quiet exultation in his eyes. He said, I'd like you to hear a song. I've just finished it, and I'd like to know what you think of it. He sat down at the piano. He didn't play the piano particularly well, and his singing voice, though true, was negligible. He played and sang the music he had just written. It was a song called Old Man River. The music mounted and mounted, and I give you my word, my hair stood on end. Tears came to my eyes. I knew that this wasn't just a musical comedy number. This was great music. This was music that would outlast Jerome Kern's day and my day and your day. And so it will. 